pretty cool to me. So it's going to take a while. All right, let me take a breath. Let's start again. Now we're going to switch to talking instead of a monument about films. And over the last, oh my gosh, I don't know how many years we have a wonderful assortment of filmmakers. We have, uh, you know, uh, film festivals, native film festivals all over the place now. And one of the film festivals that will begin in Palm Springs today is called the American Documentary and Animation Film Festival. And often it's just simply referred to as AMDOCs. And we have two filmmakers this morning. So this is going to, the, the AMDOCs, American Documentary Animation Film Festival in Palm Springs starts today, March 30th, and goes through April 3rd. So first up, we are going to be talking with Josephine Bono, or Bono? Bono. Bono, okay. And... Um, you should introduce yourself too. I don't know your name, sir. Hello. Oh, yes, I'm uh, Ray Naranjo. Hey, Ray. Thank you. I do know your name. Hey, Ray. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of Naranjos in this area, not in in the Bay Area. Are you from? Well, we'll talk about you guys in just a moment. So they they've made this film. It sounds delicious. Taste mm -hmm. of the Indigenous. So we're going to start with Josephine. Why did you decide to make a film about Native foods? Well, it actually, the, the proposition came to me. I was working on a feature film in New York City, and there was a PA who had Indigenous roots in um, Panama. His father had Indigenous roots in Panama, and he knew that I had a photography background. His father was a very famous photographer. And after we wrapped that film, he approached me and said, I have a I have a pitch for you. And he said, how about we do a photography show on indigenous food and I'll be your assistant. And he said, I know all about the lighting. I've assisted my father for many years. And then he also showed me a TED talk um, by Sean Sherman. And that TED talk, as soon as I watched that TED talk, I said, oh, we're not going to do a photography show. We're going to do a short documentary. And I just saw the entire film kind of play before my eyes pretty instantaneously. Um, and then we just hit the ground running. We went on to research to find which indigenous chefs we were going to interview. And there were very few restaurants. It was during COVID, but there's very few restaurants. That's what you realize through the research is that there aren't many indigenous restaurants and there's very few and far in between. And the few uh, that were available on the East Coast were in museums, and those muse museums were closed because of COVID. Um, so the first one that was up that we found was um, Chef Sherry Pocknett, who is, then opened up her own small restaurant called the Sly Fox Den 2, and that's in Charlestown, Rhode Island. Uh, she was unable to join us today. She may pop in. Um, I know she's not feeling so great. She's... Um, She's a little sick right now, but she's she's getting better. Uh, so her her restaurant was um, her grant her. I think it's her uncle had the first and only restaurant with Native American food on the East Coast for many years. Wow. So she also inherited all of this restaurant tour. So she was really, you know, one of the very few that I was able to go and interview and and have her filmed and and I we were so obviously needless to say fortunate that chef Sherry Pocknett and Ray chef Ray Naranjo shared their stories with us we I knew that that was very special um so we were we were really excited we kind we already knew bef once we had their consent we were really excited to to get on and and interview them so it is a really fun, and then we we went to New Mexico. We found Ray. Chef Ray is an incredible chef. He was working at the time at the um, Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and now he has his own business, which I'll let him give you the, it's incredible food. I was very lucky to actually taste his food when I went down for the Albuquerque Film Festival. And, um, and so I'll let him talk about his food, but I was blown away by the flavors and the depth. It was, I mean, to say soul food is an understatement. 
Uh, I knew it was going to be good, but it was mind blowing. Yeah, I love that Southwest Soul Food. And I and before we we go to you, Ray, I I can't help but think the uh, is it Northeastern uh, food that, that we're going to be talking about clams and quahogs and corn and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, wonderful wonderful foods. You know, um, the, it, you you're talking about two things that have sort of risen to the surface within Native America in terms of visibility, is Native films by Native people. Uh, the the cultures that are represented, the breadth and depth of cultures, but food, food has become a big deal. Uh, you know, in, in Oakland, we have a Crystal Wapipas uh, restaurant as well. So Chef Naranjo, I, I love every time I go to Albuquerque, I go to the All Indian Pueblo Council and eat. And maybe I've eaten there when you were the chef. Uh, just thank you so much. And I was talking, you guys know Gary Farmer, the uh, actor. Anyway, he I was talking to him yesterday. Uh, I think we did a show with him. And he was uh, he lives in Santa Fe. So he said after the show, he was going out after those green chilies. So we talk about native food here. Not often enough, but we sure love that. I said green chili. You should see Ray's just this huge <laughs> smile popped up. Good morning, Ray. Thank you for having me. Go ahead. Tell tell us about you about your role in this film. Okay, so uh, it was a great opportunity to uh, give our perspective on just where uh, Native Americans are in terms of food, uh, food sovereignty. And, um, um, yeah, uh, food sovereignty and yeah, he's, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, what, what does this food sovereignty mean? You know, we've got a lot of uh, non-indigenous people listening to us, by the way, we're also on, uh, are we on YouTube live, ma'am? I think we're also on YouTube Live. So uh, so talk about this uh, in, you know, food sovereignty. What does that mean? Um, well, like, like, uh, uh, like was stated before, you know, there's not a lot of Native American restaurants out there. So it's hard for us to um, have an identity through our food, um, which is also important as food is uh, usually the medium that you meet people first through. You, you uh, communicate through cultures. First, by exchanging a dish, exchanging a, a meal with somebody. Um, so it's kind of almost recreating this identity in a, in a newer context um, as our, uh, our food uh, systems were very different and very much basic and more for um, survival. Um, but now we're in a time where uh, we get to be creative and we get to... Um, uh, show food for its potential as as art, um, as well as expressing ourselves and uh, giving a taste of where we're from. Well, why, that, that sounds like a perfect introduction to uh, sharing a trailer about your movie. Why don't we watch that? It's called Taste of the Indigenous, and we're going to share that with our YouTube audience uh, as well. So... And Leanne Lindsay is driving in the background. So Leanne, take it away. Thank you. As a Native American person, you're taught that the extent of your culinary existence is fry bread, and that's as far as you're going to take it. But if you tell a young culinarian that their ingredients inspired world cuisine, then it then it changes their perspective and it and it makes them look at the world differently. I didn't realize what an honor it is to be Native, Indigenous, until I got older. My goal is to get it recognized in a professional culinary setting. It allows us to be prideful, uh, once again, as a, as a prideful people, instead of uh, always, uh, I guess, pushed down and looked at as a third world country, and that exists right in our own country. Now I'm going to skin them. That is called the sheen. And if you can get the sheen off, you're pretty good at skinning. As you grow older, you realize the disconnection between 
your old life ways and the life ways that you're in now. We're missing out on this whole other healthy way and connection to the earth. Ray, my mouth is watering. <laughs> you know, you guys looking at this uh, this trailer, Josephine, uh, it's just wonderful to see awesome, the vistas. So those of you in the radio audience who are not watching us uh, live on uh, YouTube, uh, you would have seen some beautiful vistas from New Mexico, including that scene from Shiprock, and also looking at the East Coast and at Chef Sherry uh, skinning a big fish. I don't know what that was, but... Um, <laughs> And tomatoes and potatoes, tomatoes and potatoes. I, 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 there's this long history of stories of, you know, Indians introducing tomatoes to um, the settlers. And the Europeans thought they were poisonous, so they wouldn't eat them. And so uh, as a native storyteller said once, so finally someone ate one and didn't die. So <laughs> they kept eating them. And of course, the potatoes, uh, we see purple potatoes in our stores now. And uh, a lot of that thanks to our, uh, you know, generations back in Central and South America. So this looks and uh, I mean, it should come with a, a serving of something with it when you're watching the film. <laughs> One one tasting from each chef. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That would be great. Do we get recipes? Uh, with... <laughs> That's for the series. <laughs> uh, the series. Well you, well, you know that that also reminds me. Um, Loretta Barrett Oden had a series, if you remember, on um, uh, many years ago, and I just forgot the name of it. Uh, of her series and she's a friend of mine, but that was one of the first native chefs that ever had a series on PBS. And um, I'm sorry, Loretta, I can't remember the name of the series, but, but, you know, you're right. We do need a series and uh, a cookies cooking series on the uh, cooking channel would be fun. How about you, chef Naranjo? Would you like to be on the food channel? Oh, you know, that'd be excellent. Any uh, chance to uh, show off uh what Native Americans are doing nowadays is uh, is good. What's one of your, uh, off the top of your head, your favorite uh, recipes to cook? Favorite food? Um, you know, the, the dish actually featured in that uh, film there um, is going to be featured in a, another magazine, uh, Edible Magazine. Um, and it's interesting because we would have never eaten a steak like that uh, pre-contact. It would have been maybe... 20% meat to 80% uh, plant-based diet. So these are the types of things that are that we could do now that would have never once probably would have never happened. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because those of you, again, who couldn't see the trailer and seeing all this food being roasted and, uh, you know, just bushels of um, fresh tomatoes, but that big piece of beef that took up the whole screen. So I'm sure. Yes, that was a tomahawk bison steak is what that was. <laughs> a bison steak. So all the meat eaters out there, I'm sure were thinking, wow, I want that bison. Uh, bison is really good when you can uh, you can get it. Uh, we We have a little little celebration here at the station or we used to have them pretty regularly and I'd always go out and get bison and make chili for people. So a little bit of both of uh, cultures. Uh, jo Josephine, what did you have a favorite uh, region for food that you, you enjoy tasting? Well, um, I, I will say I, I wasn't very familiar with the Native American dishes, even though when I went to college at Fordham University, one of my roommates, Sherry, uh, I'm sorry, Becky Gibson, uh, she is from the On Onondaga Nation, and I we were we are still very close, and she did introduce me to some things, but there was a lot of um, a lot that I didn't know, so I was learning as I was going. When I first went to Sherry's restaurant. She did a incredible smoked salmon dish, and I've I've had smoked salmon before, but she had the salmon steak <laughs> smoked on top of these layers of mushrooms. It was it was incredible. Uh, the 
the textures and the flavors. It was just something I've never had before. When I went down to Ray, to Ray's restaurant, we had these incredible dishes that I just never, I really just had no experience, even though I did grow up in this country. I do come from immigrant immigrant parents um, who have their own cuisine, but this was just something I never I was, I never knew about. So I thought if I don't know about it, most people don't know about it. And and there seemed to have been, and that was one of the messages in the Sean Sherman Ted talk is spreading the information and educating people, uh, which then led me after doing this short documentary, uh, wanting to do a series and wanting to have visit, have chef Sherry and chef Ray go around as the hosts taking turns and visiting different tribes and a chef from each tribe and doing an episode on each tribe. Uh, Sean Spruce is uh, located uh, where? Is he the one from Minneapolis? Yes. Okay. He was un- he was actually unavailable at the time because he was opening up his restaurant. We were going to film him, but it was a little bit too much with he was literally opening at the time of our filming. Um, but he he is aware and he is involved. He was, in, you know, he was the inspiration. I would I, I had did note that at the end of the film that he did inspire the film. That's uh, great. Great. Yeah. It, Ray, we didn't mention where the name of your restaurant and where it is. Uh, so we're called Domenko. We're actually a, a food truck, and we're uh, trying to uh, develop that into a brick and mortar. Uh, Menko is a Tewa word that means "come and eat" in our Tewa language. Wow, a food truck! I love, I love that uh, idea. I'm sure a restaurant would be a lot easier, but that's very cool. I don't know of any native food trucks, uh, except when we went to. Uh, uh, up in Connecticut, Skimitzin, there used to be this gigantic biggest powwow that I'd ever been in, and there were all kinds of native food vendors and trucks. That was very cool. So you guys, where are we going to see uh, your film uh, soon? The, well, it's actually tomorrow at the Amdocs Film Festival. It's playing at 1.30 at the Camelot Theater. If anybody in the area would like love to check it out, it would be wonderful. Um, it's an incredible it's an incredible film festival. Uh, there's also uh, a, a, a little, uh, it's like a food block. They have a short film block of all different foods. So it's very interesting. I'm excited to see the other films as well. And that that is our, our it's literally tomorrow at 1.30. So we have something coming up quickly. Tomorrow at 1.30, this is in Palm Springs, right? right. At the uh, Amdocs as uh Josephine was calling it, but that's uh, the American Documentary Film Festival, something like that, in Palm Springs. And that goes until April 3rd, I believe. So it's only three days then, something like that. Wow. So you got to hurry. Go down there and learn about all of these great chefs, uh, some history about, you know, native foods. Uh, You know, I think I think most people, you know, think of corn, beans and squash. Don't they? You know, are the aren't those called the three sisters? We do talk about the three sisters in the film. Sherry really goes into a beautiful monologue about the history of the three sisters rice. And it's I think that's actually one of the that was one of the most um, heartfelt things that happened during the filming. I wasn't expecting the stories tied to the dishes. And so the the film pretty much made itself, you know. I mean, I was just there, <laughs> but but it was it was a documentary, so it was obviously not scripted. But I could never predict the kind of stories that came out of the dishes and the history and how how tied it is to the to the earth and to the animals. It's incredible. I I did cry after each interview. Ray, I never told you that. <laughs> I interviewed you. I walked, they had sunglasses on. You couldn't tell. <laughs> but uh, both times, it was really, um, you know, incredible stories. Wow! It it just it sounds wonderful, and it is. You know, I would agree with you. This the specialness of when you're with your people or other people's. You know, uh, eating eating that food. Um, I told a story the other day about uh, visiting some people up in Seneca and I'm Muscogee. So we're not related except that we all ate white corn, this Flint corn, it's hard. And so when I, I mentioned that to the person I was talking with in uh, Seneca, so he, he brought me this bag of three pounds of white Flint corn, 
dried. So I brought it home and uh, you need ash to uh, soften it. It's called nixtamalization. How are our, you know, Indians figured that out? But that's not their world, but word. But uh, I don't know. I always guess some, I don't know, some flakes uh, uh, from a volcano fell into the, the pot of <laughs> you know, corn or something, and it made it different. And that releases all of the wonderful vitamins from it. So anyway, I did that. I I, I made it, you know, three pounds of uh, dried corn is a lot of corn. <laughs> it's a whole lot of corn. But back home, we call it softki. Uh, I think white people call it hominy is similar to that. So did you do anything on, on uh, any of the white corn? Or is that for the next, se- for the series? That's that we would definitely want to do for the series. I know Chef Ray talked a lot about the blue corn. Oh, um, and I was when I was in Albuquerque, I got to meet Chef Ray's mother, Marianne Naranjo, who took me to this to her the reservation where they made the holy bread. And that was, I think, like you are saying, a, a combination of that, but it was the blue corn with something else that really kept it, you could eat it you know, it doesn't ever go bad or spoil. So it was incredible. And the flavor was delicious. It was just this delicate, incredible flavor of this. It was almost like a corn, like the corn was rolled up, but even the process, it was so special. That was unable to be recorded. That was only, you know, you could only take it with you. So I took that with me. It was really special. You do you have a mortar and pestle so you can grind your own corns? And- I don't, but that was there. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw a mocajete in the film there. Um, yeah, that's uh, there is something so special. Uh, Chef Naranjo, t- t- tell us a little bit about the blue corn. We have a few more minutes before we're going to move to our next <laughs> film. Okay, so the blue corn is, uh, is very uh, special to the area. Um, it's it's uh, part of a lot of uh, uh, mythological stories, our creation stories based off of uh, uh, the two corn mothers. Uh, one's white and one's blue. Um, it also marks the direction of north. Um, uh, sorry, let me say that again. It marks the direction of north. And that's where, um, so when I use it in terms of uh, directions and corn colors and associations, I use flavors from the north to combine with the blue corn and uh, a lot of my uh, uh, cuisine is based off of those directions. Can you give us a sample? What, what, uh, just a sample of when you said something from the north, what would that be? Okay, so I will take our, um, from our, our table perspective, I will take the blue corn that represents the north, then I would go to um, the Great Lakes region. I will take wild rice, uh, cranberries, um, maybe some mushrooms and uh, maybe some walleye and uh, create a dish uh, that represents the Native American indigenous flavor from the North. Wow. You really are making my mouth water here. <laughs> gonna have to, we're going to have to get together and and come to your Not to mention the maple syrup. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. Maple syrup, a whole, a whole nother one. Oh my gosh. There's so many, many things. And uh, in every region of the country, here you know and out here there's a lot of seaweed we're in the land of pomos we have three um rancherias nearby we have a small one uh kashaya it's on top of a hill it's the 40 acres we have to this that's to the south of us to the north of us we have the point arena manchester it's a much larger several hundred acres and um so that's the main tribes that are here and we also have coyote valley band um who are going to be on the show soon um talking about their their trying to stop the forest from being cut but anyway what i'm trying to say is that you know there's all these different types of foods and so seaweed is one of the number one things here of the pomos along with the fish you know the salmon out here so anyway you guys i think we're i'm gonna have to move on in a couple of minutes uh josephine what else do you want to say well, uh, I I do want to uh, go again back into the the series because we are we are looking for to really push that forward. Um, we are applying for funding. We're we're applying for grants, and we are serious about putting that show on the road, so to speak, and having Chef Ray host Chef Sherry, who can join us today. But I know she 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 was excited to be a part of that um, in our treatment. We already have about eight 
different chefs lined up for different episodes. And, um, and we are looking for, for the next steps for the showrunner, basically. Uh, so we, we, uh, <laughs> we're ready. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I can just see now the the chef contest, you know, and uh, having the food trucks and the uh, the restaurant tours and and everybody and have you know here's the six ingredients, uh, see what you can do with these. Uh, it would be wonderful. Well, I look forward to seeing your film and good luck at Amdocs. Oh, but I do want to, people to know though that this film has won awards every. The Cannes Film Festival, and uh, I, I can't remember all the places, uh, but congratulations on that. You. you know, I think that is well deserved. And it's really nice to see something, have something contemporary, something fun. And, you know, the reality of our wonderful foods and chef, what you're doing with it as well. So uh, we'll have to talk again sometime. I'd love to do that. And let's get that series going, whatever it's going to be. And uh, thank you guys so much, Josephine Bono and and uh, our chef um, Naranjo. I can't remember. Ray, Chef Ray Naranjo, uh, and who definitely describes himself having roots from both the ancient Puebloans of the Southwest and the three fire tribes of the Great Lakes. So no wonder you got that. The, that going on there thank you guys so much and uh, just let your friends know this this repeats at one o'clock it'll be on our soundcloud uh, on kgua and then of course we're doing this live on youtube so that'll be there for a while too thank you guys so much thank you so much for having me you bet thank you as well all right chef thank you all right well that's Part one of Peggy's Place this morning, we are zooming around this morning, uh, talking about native films and um, Amdocs shorts. And uh, the first one, of course, was about food, Josephine Bono and Chef Ray Naranjo. And now we're going to take a short breath. Oh, and a big shout out to Chef uh, Sherry Pocknett, who wasn't able to join us uh, from the Northeast. And um, I've that was so great to have uh, that that visit. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk to Evan Marie Pettit. Is that correct? No, it's Petit. Petit. It is Petit. Well, you look very Petit. <laughs> How are you this morning? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Uh, can you move closer to your mic or turn your mic up? Uh, uh, just a reminder, folks, you're listening to Peggy's Place this morning on KGUA in Gualala, uh, and uh, that's Northern California. So today we're talking about, first we talked about a, documentaries about native foods that has left our mouths watering and craving blue corn and everything else. And now we're going to move to a different uh, type of a film. Um, and the uh, producer, director of this film is Evan Marie Petit. And uh, I loved going to your website where you started your introduction to yourself with a poem, you know, and you don't see that very often. Uh, you wouldn't happen to have a copy of the poem in front of you, would you? Oh. Um you know, I'm not sure which which poem you're speaking of. Um, I, I am a visual storyteller. It's not a poem, but it reads yeah. like a poem. Um, oh, you know what? I think you're looking on um, my other website. Um, so, yeah, that that's for my event work. Um, but I don't know if you have my documentary um, and filmmaking website. Um, but I can I can give you an intro of who I am. Um, yeah. Please, please do that. I, I, we, I'm sorry. I, I do have a, you are a documentary photographer and filmmakers, stories that support environmental, cultural, and indigenous rights and movements. And are you indigenous, Evan? Um, yes, my ancestry my, on my matriarchal side is from the Georgia Band of Eastern Cherokee. Oh. Uh, yeah, we're from um, that territory. I was born and raised there. Um, in a little town called Hickory Flat, which is in Cherokee County um, in North Georgia. <clears throat> and um, I also have European lineage as well. So I'm a, I'm a mixed person. <laughs> well, that's a, well, aren't we all? Bernadette, is that you there? Looks like we've been joined by Bernadette Smith. 
Um, anyway, uh, Evan, I'm uh, Muskogee, but our roots are from Georgia, you know, where, as you know, Jackson moved us from Georgia and we had to walk on what's known as the Trail of Tears, although it's known as Cherokee Trail of Tears. There are a lot of tribes there. So, Ms. Bernadette, is that you? Yes, this is me. Hi, Peggy. Hey, how are you? Wow, it's good. Good, start. thank you. <laughs> yes, you, yes, you are. So you, uh, so so Evan, tell us about the film uh, th that you want to talk about right now. Sure. So, uh, Pomo Land Back: A Prayer from the Forest was um, also produced with Coyote Valley Band of Pomo, particularly Great. Michael Hunter. Um, he is our executive producer. Also, my partner Lewis Fox. Um, was also the other producer of the film. And um, it was really a collaboration with Michael um, when he, you know, told me that there was going to be these walks happening. And then of course this intertribal ceremony that was happening um, in Jackson Demonstration Forest, um, it felt really clear that that was a very legacy building moment. Um, it felt pretty historical um, to have all the native folks, the different bands of Pomo coming back to the forest um, from all over Mendocino County to hold ceremony. Um, and it was really significant because it was held in a clear cut um, in, in Jackson Demonstration Forest. And it felt like it was a really big reclaiming of, um, yeah, just <laughs> culture and ceremony and of the forest where um, these multiple tribes, their ancestry comes from. And so um, it, it I felt a deep call to say, can, can we document this? Can we document and, and share this um, with the world to get the message out of what, go, what is going on in Jackson Demonstration Forest and really create a piece um, that, that, that honors the native, native legacy um, of this proclaiming of what's happening in the name of um, indigenous folks coming together to call for co-management co and sovereignty over how our forests are managed in California. Um, and so that's, that's how it came about. Um, and of course, Michael was, uh, loved the idea and, and gave us the permission to, to film that ceremony. Um, and so the film is uh, just like a little visceral poetic document of, of that ceremony. And of course, Bernadette was there. Um, she's a big part of the film of holding the container um, of the ceremony with her song. Um, and yeah, I really wanted to give people, uh, you know, non-Native folks a, a feeling of, of what it's like to be in ceremony. I really feel like um, prayer-led movements and, and our future for our environment really is led by Indigenous folks doing it in a good way and wanted to drop people in to what it feels like to be in ceremony um, so it could speak to their hearts and, and they could feel included. Um, and really want to to take action on behalf of these issues as well. Well, that's a very um, important concept. I'm kind of of two minds of this. Though. And, you know, Bernadette, um, you're becoming a film star, Bernadette, the second film <laughs> you're in. Uh, but, and in fact, I was talking to another uh, Native friend just yesterday about ceremony and uh and uh, talking about ceremony and how, you know, there's so much, there's only so much we can talk about from tribe to tribe that we can do and share publicly. Uh, but Evan, as you said, that feeling that comes from participating in a ceremony, whether it's your own people or reclaiming a ceremony as so many tribes have to do, or people who have them, um, Bernadette, do you want to address that at all about this, both sides of this, the sharing of ceremonies, but the importance of experiencing them? Yeah, so you hear, um, you know, non-Native people hear mostly about Native practices and our ceremonies and can only imagine what those are, right? Um, they have an idea, maybe some are influenced by what they've seen in a movie, you know, like many in America, that's what their knowledge as far as it goes. So being able to experience that even through film or through recordings, it's a beautiful thing. And it is giving an opportunity for non-Native allies to kind of connect in that way, get a sense of what we're doing. I'm hoping that even through hearing song, you know, they could be able to experience or feel something like that and kind of understand what we mean when we say we have a spiritual connection here. 
It's more than the physical. It's more than what we see in the land that we touch physically, but there's some connection that runs deeper. So really capturing that feeling and that spirit and being able to um, have it seen throughout the world, you know, and felt throughout the world is something that's really important. And, you know, we, we welcome any kind of um, representation that wants to be shared and, and filmmakers and people who come from a good place of intention that want to help us spread that word and help us get our message across. Um, and like, we really appreciate the work that you did. Well, it's beautiful. No. So uh, you're listening. To, we're just listening to the voice of Bernadette Smith, who is one of our local uh, uh, Pomo people here from Point Arena, Manchester tribe. And uh, she's been doing a lot of work uh, as she has grown into the woman she is and in being involved in so many spiritual uh, activities. And uh, we're all very proud of Bernadette around here. You know what? I think it's time that we play the trailer for Pomo Land Back. Why don't we do that? And we'll come back and talk with Evan and Bernadette some more. I'm really enjoying this meeting all of you and watching mm -hmm. your films. Here we go. If tribes are involved in the decision making, it never ends up good. Today we're here for Mother Earth. Today we're here for the plant nation and the trees. Today we're here to cry out and to sing our songs and to pray. All we're asking for is a moratorium on logging in the Jackson Demonstration State Forest until the tribes can sit with the agencies to determine what is right. Wow, that was short and very powerful. And uh, it is always fun to see some faces of people you know from the community who are, as you were saying, Bernadette, it's so important to carry that on. And Evan, thank you for uh, getting the permission to share what you're able to share, um, the, the wonderful twirling pomo dancers and the clacker sticks and all, all of that. But this is something that's happening like, I don't know, but what is it, 40 miles from uh, Gualala or Point Arena, something like that, the Jackson mm -hmm. Demonstration Force. It's not that far. So who wants to tell us about what's going on there? I mean, this is, we're talking about redwoods there, huge forests. Yeah, so I can chime in there. So basically a uh, little history on the Jackson State Forest. It's one of the largest forests um, owned by Cal and owned by um, the state. So it's kind of a, what we call a public land. Um, historically, it was used and, and set aside for activities and outdoor, just the, the purpose of um, being in the redwoods, hiking, everybody's grown to love it for what it's been as far as that. But more currently, Cal Fire has given permission for forest um, deforestation to be happening there, like taking down the trees um, and basically, the activists that have been involved, the non um, the non native allies that have been protesting and active um, doing activism against it, have been confronting and forcing Cal Fire to suspend timber harvest planning or, or moving forward with any timber harvest plan, which was really good. That was part of it. That was the first thing they did. They kind of halted that, and um, moving forward, they had some petitions going around. Um, they wanted people to just pretty much stop them permanently and, and make them kind of see that the carbon sequestration, that process of capturing and storing atmospheric carbon dioxide is so important in that forest because the trees are over 100 years old. Although they're second growth trees, they are still over 100 and store so much of that carbon there. So just that alone, I think that with the environmentalists have been like a strong um, reason and why they wanted to keep that from happening. But then we come in tribally and know that because it's such a large area, the amount of cultural um, sites that are there, gathering sites, historical sites for our people within that 500 uh, acres is, is just, you know, um, it's very important to be able to protect those sites. It's very important for us to be able to go there and 
not just uh, be with the trees, but, you know, have ceremony there, just have access, just being able to go there and then still be there for our grandchildren to be able to go and touch them and, and be with them like our grandmothers were. Um, it's so vitally important to us as a people. And I think that's where we were able to find that um, common ground with our non-native allies and within our tribal community is we both want to protect the forests. So we both um, came together and they were able to um, do some do some negotiations, not exactly where they want to be yet, but the process and the fight hasn't stopped. And we did have a few uh, six elders get arrested out in Sacramento when they were going and sitting in front and um, kind of holding it down there, demanding answers from Crowfoot and wanting to know like, what's he gonna do? You know, how is he gonna help? Um, so yeah, the fight's been continuing and it continues still today. And we were just uh, really happy that we had so many people coming out and so many um, people standing with us, sharing in our struggle and really wanting to help. And really that intention, like I said, it's so pure from both sides. And it's not just the native issue. This is a human issue. This is about climate change. This is about protecting ourselves as a people globally. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah you, you just said so many, many things. And uh, also watching you and uh, your emotions as you were talking about this. And I want to go back to that for a second. The information is absolutely vital and gathering allies is so important to native people because we're, we're small. Most of our tribes are fairly small. Uh, even the largest tribes are fairly small considering the population. But Bernadette, at one point you were talking about the event and the feeling and I watched your face change and your eyes change. And what was going on with you then when you were remembering that? So I would say just seeing, uh, cause it's been times when, and, and it's unfortunate that there's not many of our native community that comes out to those types of events. Um, more so traditionally now we, that type of tree hugging and that mentality has been what we might, well, my generation might look at as what they would say hippie or something like that, you know? Um, but things are changing. And that day in particular, we had so many native people coming out and gathering and learning about what we're doing out there, why we're there. And that really had, you know, that impacted me, that made me feel hopeful. So just thinking back on that day and seeing the dancing happening there, all the native faces that were there, not just non-native people, because a lot of times that's unfortunately not unfortunately, that's the wrong word, but sometimes that's the majority of the people who are there are our non-native allies who we love. And we, um, you know, we always encourage more, but that day in particular, we did have a larger uh, attendance of native people, a native presence there. And that's all I ever hope for is for our people to kind of come out and step foot here, see what we're talking about, because then you, you'll understand just by being there seeing those clear cutting acres and seeing all those dead trees, it really does something to you as a native person. It really pulls at you. And for them to be able to uh, get that many people out there, that was a beautiful thing. And I brought a group of young kids from my tribe and let them see, and it really opens their eyes, you know? So, and that's another reason why putting this uh, little film out, the short film out about it was really important because it allows for more people to see that. And hopefully, like Evan said, like they can feel something through the film, even though they might not have the opportunity to come out. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Evan, um, let's go back to the film. Uh, and I, I just... Uh, Re I'm reminded you and I met uh, along with Leanne Lindsay at the Mendocino Film Festival last year, I bet, for a little bit. And, you know, that's uh, you meet so many people. And, and when especially I mean, you're at a big event like that. Uh, is your film going to be shown in Mendocino this year? It's not. Um, you know, there was a little oh. bit, was a part <laughs> of me that was like, it needs a re uh, a replay. Um, because a lot of the community at the event last year um, couldn't get in. It was in a um, it was in the town hall, and 
there was a line around the building and a lot of the locals didn't get in and they really want to, and especially like a lot of the native folks, you know, still haven't seen it that are part of the Como tribe. And um, yeah, so I, I was feeling a calling to write to them and see if they wanted to do a, a, a part two um, replay, but um, I, haven't, I haven't done that yet. When you, you know, I've never been to Amdocs and I haven't been to that many film festivals and having uh, my uh, a cohort here, Leanne Lindsay, who's uh, very much into films and making her own, but has gotten me more involved in uh, going to a lot of these film festivals. And and then this year, I actually have, am part of a film that's being shown, not me personally, but I'm part of the uh, process. And that's has taken me to film festivals. And I have to say, you know, it's such a wonderful experience to be able to sit there and experience the film with other people. And so, so Evan, I want to go back to that. How did you get into filmmaking? Why did you decide to choose this? It's not yeah. easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. <laughs> it's a lot of work that people don't see behind the scenes, especially, you know, it's amazing um, getting to be in the field and drop in with communities and beautiful stories and culture. Um, that's really what, what drives me. But you know, the hard work is the sitting on the computer editing that um, nobody sees. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, so I have been a visual storyteller for a long while now um, through my documentary photography. And um, so this is my first film actually. Um, and my partner, Lewis Fox, um, is a longtime filmmaker and director that we have been producing um, a feature film together for the past three years. Um, but when this, when this opportunity came about, um, it was just, yeah, really a calling to, to document and help share this, this story that's of what's going on. So um, I would say the Pomo Land Back film, as well as my other film, are really how I got into filmmaking. I feel like, um, as a documentarian, you know, photography is beautiful, but being able to add songs and prayers and, you know, the movement um, and dance into a piece is just a whole different world um, that I love so much. So, um, yeah, that, that's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have a chance someday to talk more. So your film is showing uh, this weekend at the American Documentary Film Festival, short, known as Amdocs in Palm Springs. Do you, when is it showing for those who might be going down there? Um, you know, I have to look up the date again. I'm actually not there. I wasn't able to attend. Um, and so I, you know, I actually don't have the date and time of, of what day it is of the film festival. Um, sorry, that's bad representation, but yeah. <laughs> it, it happens. And, you know, it, it's not surprising. I mean, filmmakers, it, it, how many uh, festivals has this been in so far? Oh, it's been in a handful of festivals. Um, that was really like the whole goal was to, to get this message out to the a wide audience. And that was really the intention of putting it in film festivals. Um, so it, it's been in, I'm just uh, so it's been in the Red Nation Film Festival, which is an all like our country's only all native um, film festival besides the American Indian Film Festival, which it was also in. Um, it was in the Mill Valley Film Festival, um, Mendocino, Amdocs. Um, and then it's in a little offshoot Women in Film, um, the Red Nation Film Festival coming up as well. So there's a handful. <laughs> Well, that's a good handful. It's in a lot of very good places. Yes. Yeah. So, so Bernadette, uh, we just have a, a, a minute left here. Uh, what do you think is the importance of having these these films out for? Native? Well, spreading knowledge, spreading awareness, like that's what they're made for, you know, just getting the message out there, letting them know, because you never know who it's going to reach. It might um, resonate with somebody that it needs to. And that's where we just say creator can take it from here. You know, we are just his vessels, his tools, and we all contribute our our gifts to that. And we just kind of let him move it about how he needs to, you know. So it's important that we create and, and have that space and time together so that can happen. And then, like I always say, I just let him him take it from there, you know. <laughs> well, we are out of time, ladies. I'm sorry, but I really appreciate you being here. And Bernadette, it was a nice surprise to see your face popping up there. Uh, Evan Marie Petit, uh, Petit. 
uh, the uh, director and producer of um, this film that is showing at Amdocs. So What's the name again for us? Pomo Land Back, A Prayer from the Forest. Yeah, I love that name, Pomo Land Back, A Prayer from the Forest. And it's showing at Amer- Amdocs uh, in Palm Springs. And we'll look for it in other places. Uh, thank you all for listening to Peggy's Place this morning. Uh, it just has zoomed along so quickly. And uh, I thank you all. We got to go, but we're not done with Indians. We're going to Native America calling down yeah. in Turkey, New Mexico. So bye, everybody. And thank bye. you for making it a great show. Thank you.